again. See how I live with every piece of you. All right, from there. One, two, three, and see now. Change. 
change it all. From there. All right, let's start. Let's start. One, two, three. Scars are. to our band. Let's see who's here after lunch. Let's do some roll call. Do we have Covenant of the Sacred Heart New York? Who's here? How about Creighton Prep? Creighton Prep High School? Yeah, that's right. Sel Selenium High School. No? Okay. Chevris from Maine. Chevris from Maine. UNCW Catholic Newman Center. St. Louis University High School. Regis College, Regis College. Notre Dame School of Manhattan. Do we have Notre Dame School of Manhattan? Yeah, that's right. Bray Buff Jesuit, Bray Buff Jesuit, Indiana. Marquette University, Marquette University, Boston's College School of Theology and Ministry. St. Peter's Prep, do we have St. Peter's Prep? And how about Fairfield University? St. Ignatius College Prep, California, San Francisco? San Francisco? St. Xavier High School, do we have you? Yeah, that's right. Spring Hill College, what about Spring Hill? Yeah, right here in the front. Rockhurst High School, are you here? Rockhurst. Newton, Newton County Day School is the Sacred Heart. What about you guys, are you here? Okay, I'm sure you are. Loyola High School, Loyola High School. Another Xavier High School. Yeah, exactly. Fordham University, my alma mater, Fordham. That's right. St. John's Jesuit High School. St. John's. Georgetown Prep. Georgetown Prep. Bishop Kenevan High School. What about you guys, are you here? Regis High School. Regis High School, Denver. Kino Border Initiative. Keep KBI, thanks for being here. The Winandi family, what about you guys? And how about Creighton University Schlegel Center for Service and Justice? Yeah, that's right. John Carroll University. John Carroll. How about University of Detroit Mercy, UDM? And how about Jesuit High Portland, Portland, Oregon? Gannon University, what about you guys? Exciting, Loyola Blakefield, Loyola Blakefield? How about Crystal Ray Dallas, Crystal Ray Dallas? And Chris, how about Bellarmine San Jose, Bellarmine College Prep, San Jose? What about Bellarmine Tacoma, Bellarmine Col Preparatory Tacoma? We just got a couple more here, Bishop Odell, High school, yeah? I'm sure we got lots of people from Boston College. Boston College? What about Boston College High School? Can you scream louder? And our last, what about Brophy College Prep? Phoenix, yeah. Thanks everyone, that's exciting. Thanks for being here, it's wonderful to have you all here. Sorry if we missed anyone during roll call this year. Which one? Chicago, did we, did we hear Crystal Ray Chicago? We call you guys yet? Okay, we're gonna welcome up Chris Carr to do some announcements and talk for a few minutes. Thank you very much. Nice job. All right, let's give it up for Lucas. Nice job, all right. Can, can everyone hear me out there? Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Uh, we're gonna hear a little bit more about our sponsors here in a second, and we're working really hard to get this wall I'm really grateful to the hotel staff and to brother Ken Holman who is working to move this wall. No more walls, okay. Um, if I can have your attention though, if I can have your attention please. Thank you, thank you so much. Before we hear a little bit more about our sponsors, I wanted to tell you about an important campaign that ISN is working on in partnership with a number of Jesuit partners across the country. It's called the Campaign for Hospitality. And on your chair should have been a sticker, either an orange or a red sticker. Hold it up for me, let me see it. Okay. Here's the deal. 
The campaign, thank you. The campaign for hospitality was created, and it's a project that actually started with Jesuit schools, universities, uh, parishes, other ministries in Latin America. And now it's here in the United States and Canada, and it invites us all to create a, a culture of hospitality for those who migrate, okay? You can become part of the campaign. You can lift up the message on that sticker by going right now to our website, campaignforhospitality.org. If you go there, you will find, it'll say, join the campaign. And you can join it as an individual, an individual, and then you can think about how you can join, maybe your school, your parish, your university can join as well, okay? If you don't want the sticker, it's okay. Just leave it underneath your chair and we'll grab it uh, later on today. But we'd love for you to become part of this campaign to promote a culture of hospitality to, uh, towards those who migrate across both the US and Canada, all right? And now, on to our sponsors. I told you about them earlier. They have their beautiful logos on the back of that great uh, program book. And I'd like to invite up Joshua Mayfield and Kat Clark of Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. Josh and Kat. Hello, Teachin! Oh. <laughs> Just excited to be here this weekend. Okay, so who doesn't really know what their next steps are in life? Okay, good. And who here wants service to be a big part of the rest of their lives but isn't quite sure how to make that happen? Hi, my name's Kat Clark. I graduated from Boston College in 2015. Okay. And, but for the past two years, I've been Miss Clark at Chris Ray New York High School. Hi, my name is Josh Mayfield. I graduated from Loyola Marymount University in 2016. And last year, I was in Juneau, Alaska with Jesuit Volunteer Corps Northwest. Um, when I was in Alaska, I fell, I fell in love with people and service, and I wanted to see how I could make service a focal point of my career, and I found that at Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. And I first fell in love with service while an undergraduate at Boston College, but it was during my two years as a counselor at Cristo Rey that I fell in love with my students and realized that I had way more questions than I had even close to answers to. And studying at the STM has allowed me to finally put words to those, to those questions so I can be the best version of myself for my students and for the wider world. When I came here a couple of years ago, I had no intentions of going to grad school or studying theology, but I decided that if I wanted to be a minister in today's world, I need to get equipped with the skills in Boston College School of Theology and Ministry has those tools. So if you want to learn more information, come to our booth right outside these doors. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, and next up from our friends at America Media, here are Carrie Weber and Angelo Jesus Canta. Good afternoon. My name is Carrie Weber, and this is Angelo Canta, and we represent America Media, which is the publisher of America Magazine, which has been around since 1909. It's a magazine published by the Jesuits, but we're, way we're also way more than that. We're a media ministry uh, that offers podcasts, videos, um, also a great new website, all of which has recently been redesigned. And if you look into the bags that you were given at registration, there should be a copy of that newly redesigned magazine in there with articles on ministry for millennials, on immigration, examine, uh, spirituality of Instagram, all sorts of things. We also have a new podcast called Jesuitical. Uh, Angelo's modeling the t-shirt, as are almost all of our staff. You may have just come from their session with the live recording. If you haven't heard it, it's a free, you can free, download uh, and subscribe free on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you do that, if you pull out your phone, if you subscribe, uh, and you come show us at our booth right outside this door, we will give you a free Jesuitical t-shirt. Uh, so feel free to do that and then come see us. And Angelo is going to speak briefly about other ways to be involved. Hello everyone, my name is Angelo. I just graduated this past May from Loyola University Chicago. Go Blurs! Um, I'm an O'Hare Fellow at America Media, which means I get to work and live in New York uh, for the year. 
I write, I design, I'm an audio engineer on this wonderful podcast, I produce videos with my colleagues, the other O'Hare fellows. If you're a senior at a Jesuit college or university and are interested in keeping this mission alive and keeping your, the things that you've learned in school alive and want to work in Catholic media, come talk to us. We have some flyers. Come chat with us. We're really fun and really cool. Thanks. All right, thank you, America. And now, uh, Denise Garcia from the University of San Francisco. Yeah? No. Uh, it looks like, no, wait, there's a whole crew from the University of San Francisco. Even better. Here they come. Here come, go, go Dons. Here they go. Sorry about that. Just stand really close to me, okay? Immigrants, the seeds that bloom in winter. We the people who will persist, bloom of resilience in many shades without fear. We're here to stay, Joanna Rain. Ignorant allied with power is the most ferocious enemy justice can have, Jane Baldwin. Do the best you can until you know better, but then when you know better, do better. Injustice everywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects us all indirectly. Martin Luther King. I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education, and culture for their minds and dignity. Equality and freedom for their spirits, MLK. I am for truth, no matter who tells it. I am for justice, no matter who it's for or against, Malcolm X. Hello everyone, we are the University of San Francisco representatives for the Ignatian Family Teaching Program. We are here today to represent our diverse student bodies and their commitment to social justice, which is why we started off with quotes of many diverse leaders in the social justice spectrum. We are honored to come learn from this experience, from the speakers to you, the participants. I am extremely impressed with the energy and unity that everyone has been exuding this entire time. Let's evolve and change, this, change from this conference and let's change the world from here. everyone. I am here to introduce our next Ignatian Network speakers. First up, we have Ben Hur Navarro, SJ, and Jane Bleasdale from the University of San Francisco presenting I Am Who God Made Me, supporting our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. Following that, we will have um, a student from Brophy College Preparatory School, Nelson Martinez, presenting Beyond Borders. So please give it up for Mr. Navarro and Dr. Bleasdale. Yeah. Hello, my name is Jane Bleasdale, and I lived in the same town as Adele for two years. <laughs> Snap. I saw her at 7-Eleven once, but I guess you don't want to hear that. So um, we are here to talk to you about the experience of our LGBTQ community. As a member of the community, I am also a proud graduate of Fordham University and a former administrator of St. Peter's Prep in Jersey City. When we heard from Father Massingale yesterday about race being at the center of everything, we wanted to take one of his quotes to think about the context for our work today. Father Ben Hur Navarro and I have been working with the trans community in San Francisco. 
And I've been interviewing graduates of Catholic education from around the country who are trans people about their experiences in Catholic schools. I have to tell you, it's bloody awful. In 2017, 21 transgender folks have been killed in the USF, sorry, in the US, not USF. <laughs> we don't kill anybody there, we're California, we're just peace men. <laughs> so uh, 21 transgender folks have been killed in 2017. Seven transgender women were killed in the first six weeks of 2017. Six of the seven were black, and one was Native American Indian. I want to give a shout out to Father Brian Massengale as an ally to our community. But I also want to say that we have found in our work that people in Catholic schools are more comfortable talking to us about the LGBTQ community than they are about race. We've had people reach out to us and ask us how they can be more inclusive for the transgender community, and that is why Father Ben Hur and I have been working on this, because our honest answer was, we really don't know. The photograph that you see is from Ella, a community in San Francisco for transgender women um, in the Latino community. You'll notice at the center of the photograph is a picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe and an altar. These women, called on Father Ben-Hur because their own priest refused to give them the, the sacraments when they needed at the most um, challenging times of their lives. And at the heart of their center and at the heart of their mission is the altar. In recent years, we've heard incredible discourse around the transgender community in our schools and in our churches. And we're here to invite you to understand and to be inclusive of the LGBTQ community, but specifically of the trans community. People ask me, how can Jesuit Catholic high schools and universities and churches include the transgender community? And I respond, how can they not? I'm now gonna let Ben Hur, Father Ben Hur, continue to speak. He's a friend, he's a current student in our leadership program, and he is a Jesuit who's truly living the mission of accompaniment. Thank you. Un saludo para todos y todas aquí reunidos este domingo. Hello to everyone in this big room. My name is Benjur Navarro, la de movie, Benjur. A Colombian Jesuit. I have been working in the Jesuit high school for 12 years in Colombia. My pronouns are he, him, his. For the last two years, I have been studying for a master's degree in educational leadership at the University of San Francisco. During this time, I have been accompanying Latino communities in different parishes on weekends. Once or twice a week, I have been involved with the Latino Foundation of transgender people. I want to ask the transgender people for this permission to talk about their life stories. If there are transgender people here, please allow me to approach this human reality as one enters a holy place barefooted. What can be deeper than the experience of knowing other human beings, other human beings and ourselves in our darkness and light? The conversations I have, I have had about what it means for these people to live in a body that does not correspond to their psyche has deepened my understanding of the complexity of human beings. Facing this overwhelming reality, I ask myself, how does one live in the world not being what one feels they should be? For those of you who have not has, have this experience, I invite you to consider the following questions. What would become of us if we were prohibited from dressing as we like and playing as we like? If 
our mothers told us that we are not their children because of our appearance? Are we an error of God? No doubt this is a life that nobody would want to live. As we, as we reflect on the adverse experience of trans people, our understanding of God is more questioned. For those of us who are Catholic, the God of Jesus is revealed in the history of humanity. This is the experience of God that I have lived and believed in, a God that is revealed to me in my own life story. They have allowed me to witness their life story with a strong emphasis on finding an identity in this world that is harvest to them. Pope Francis recommends to us how to engage in this companionship. He said, those who accompany their brothers and sisters in faith need to accompany with mercy and passion the eventual stage of personal growth as these occur. I believe that as a Catholic Christian, I must reflect on the most vulnerable people in our society. Jesus reincorporated in the society of his time those people who were previously excluded. If my faith is rooted in the experience of Jesus, then my mission is to include those who had been excluded from society. How do I accomplish this mission? How do I, a Jesuit priest, row, row in deep waters? The Pope has told us about a church which goes forth. Francis reminds Christian that we remain steadfast in our intention to respect others, to heal wounds, to build bridges, to strengthen relationships, and to bear one another's burdens. It is time for the Catholic Church to be aware and value the life stories of each member of the community, because God is revealed by giving a creative identity to each historical subject. In national spirituality, aims to seek out and find in each human being the will of a God who constantly crea creates us. A characteristic of Ignatian spirituality is the magis. Magis is beyond producing results endorsed and applauded by valuation of excellence. Magis in our times should be the praxis which means action and reflection. And at breaking attitudes of indifference or passivity facing the dehumanization of the world. The magic implies or contributes a sense of justice to the degree to which human beings who experience its spirit with social relation to all of respect and accept, acceptance for the life history of others. Another characteristic of Ignatian spirituality is discernment. This allows us to live in relation to others in the most authentic way possible by perceiving our life, our life history as God's will. We, all of us, Ignatian people, cannot remain passive in the face of situation where the human being is dehumanized. It is in these existential frontiers that the Catholic faith opens new perspective that can help everyone to understand human expression in this wide diversity. This would, would really be rowing in deep waters. I invite you all to live the faith of a God who creates and accepts accepts the 
that diverse human being who carries out his, her, their full realization of divinity that God has played in his, her, their existence as a divine creature. That is why no human being in the LGBTQ community is an error of God. Each one is a child of God. Each one is a child of God created to embrace his, her, their own being. I invite you in all in our Indonesian community to live the magis and practice discernment as a community practice, supporting people from the trans community. In this way, our communities of faith grow in deep waters, making a valuable contribution to a more inclusive society that promotes an increasingly just world. Es por eso que ningún ser humano en la comunidad LGBTQ es un error de Dios. Cada ser humano es un hijo de Dios. Creado para acoger su propio ser, invito a nuestras comunidades ignacianas a vivir el mayes y el discernimiento como una praxis comunitaria, apoyando a las personas de la comunidad trans. De esta manera, nuestras comunidades de fe reman en aguas profundas, haciendo una valiosa contribución a una sociedad más inclusiva que promueva un mundo cada vez más justo, un mundo que refleje profundamente el reino de Dios. Thank you. You're killing me, Smalls. <laughs> like everyone else, I remember my first time watching The Sandlot. I remember laughing when Squins tricked Wendy Peppercorn into kissing him, and I'm sure everyone else looked up to Benny the Jet Rodriguez just as I did. I also remember my first time playing on a basketball team. Now, I was a star, of course. <laughs> my brother, a star in his varsity high school team, taught me how to play. So, all, so I, a bald, tiny eight-year-old, practice every day just so I could be like him. I remember being at my first varsity football game. Until then, never have I ever heard of 2 Chains, Drake, Justin Bieber, and Taylor Swift in a single playlist. <laughs> I remember a lot from my childhood, especially when I was called an alien. See, you and I probably had a similar childhood, except I was an undocumented kid, and many of you weren't. Now, I still went out to eat with my friends and did reckless stuff. I mean, what kid doesn't? But I carried the burden of being an alien, a rapist, a thug. I grew up with my mother and I glued to the radio and television, hearing about laws like SB 1070, laws that essentially made driving while Mexican illegal. I, a child then, would watch as people like me were put in chains and paraded out as if we were animals. And I knew people saw me that way. A little brown boy with a slight accent. I was a normal child, but I never had a normal childhood. Now, I did normal things to try and fit in, but I could never ride a plane or visit New York. I could never travel to Europe or travel anywhere, because if I did, I would not be allowed back into the US, back into my home. Now imagine this, imagine going outside in your slippers to pick up the mail and then coming back to find that your door is locked, that your clothes, your memories, everything that you've grown up with is inside your house. Now you can look inside, but you can't go in. That is my reality. I'm locked out of my home, I'm outside looking in. Or at least I was, because one day, my mother told me that my DACA application was accepted. And for the first time, for the first time, I was finally able to live my life the way I wanted to, without having the fear of being deported. 
I started doing things I had never done before, like saying hello to police officers, whistling as I walked my school's halls, taking walks of joy. Do you know how happy you have to be to take a walk just for joy? <laughs> and it's funny that what the small card symbolized made me feel like a true American, and I was proud to be one. And so the next day, after I walked into my school, after finally having received my DACA card, and was celebrated by my group of best friends. Thank you, Zeke. We're on our guy school, so there's that. They celebrated like lunatics and jumped on top of me, almost suffocating me with their joy. <laughs> and then after they settled down and stopped being crazy kids, one of them came up to me and said, Nelson, I'm glad you won't be going anywhere. I love you, man. Now I didn't cry when I watched the Titanic, but I sure did shed a tear when he said those words to me. You see, to them, to my best friends, they were happy that their Nelson would be staying with them and that he would no longer be facing the fear of deportation. However, we know that is not the case anymore. On September 5th, 2017, DACA was rescinded, sending me and thousands of other people just like me into an uncertain future. But I stand here today asking you to take action in creating a bright and sustainable future for people like me, for people that are your friends, teammates, classmates, coworkers, people who are willing to work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. to get the job done right, people who value integrity above all other virtues, people who believe in the American dream our forefathers and mothers have created people who have come to this country as immigrants, as children, and know no other flag than the one they so proudly honor. And I ask you to stand for these dreamers, for these immigrants, for these children, for these human beings who wish nothing more than to reside in the home of the free and the land of the brave. Because you know what? It doesn't matter whether you're black or white, Christian or Muslim. It doesn't matter whether you're transgender or not. If you believe in the ideals of happiness and chasing your dreams, you are American. So when you leave here today, and when you speak to anyone about pushing Congress to pass the DREAM Act, more specifically, when you speak to your representatives and they ask you if anyone you know will be affected by DACA, you say this, I have a friend named Nelson, and there are thousands more like him, and they sure as hell deserve to live the American dream. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all three of our speakers, Father Ben Hur, uh, Jane, and especially lastly to Nelson for sharing the stories of your experience. And uh, we're very grateful for your witness of justice and, and uh, standing for values of fairness and justice here. Now, uh, to follow up what Nelson has just told us, we're going to hear from Kristen Leonetti. I'd like to introduce her to the stage. Kristen. Uh, works for the Jesuit Conference of Canada in the United States. She's going to be speaking to us now uh, in the exact, uh, what we can do as Nelson is calling us to go meet with our congressional leaders. We'll do that tomorrow. Kristen's gonna talk to us about some nuts and bolts about immigration reform that will help us uh, be able to communicate with our legislators and to share stories like Nelson's to, uh, to our congressional leaders. So I'd like to welcome to the stage my dear colleague, Kristen Leonetti of the Jesuit Conference. Hello. How are y'all doing? Going strong still, I hope. 
Right. Well, I want to thank you uh, for being here, and I want to thank you for the energy that you all have brought to Washington. Uh, it really is a gift for us, and it's one that we're really eager for you to bring to the Hill tomorrow. Uh, for those of you who were here last year, you may remember that immediately following the elections, we were aware of many threats to our immigrant sisters and brothers, but we were unsure of exactly what was to come. Today, we pause to take stock of what this year has meant, what we've seen happen, what we believe uh, may lie ahead, and what each of us can do. So as you know, and as we've been hearing throughout the weekend, this has been a challenging year. Rather than acknowledging the dignity of the migrant in our midst, U.S. policies have reflected alienation, the criminalization of migration, and they have sown division in our communities. We know that this affects all of us in different ways, but I want to acknowledge that it affects some among us, as we have heard very, very personally. For those uh, who are here with us from those experiences, I want to say thank you so much for being present with us. Thank you for the experiences that you share with us. Thank you for the courage that you bring, and thank you for the ways that you help us to grow as an Ignatian family. We will continue to hold uh, you in our hearts, and more importantly, I hope we will seek to search for ways that we can uh, enter into greater and greater solidarity with you. So let's talk a little bit about what this year lo has looked like, both in terms of policies and also in terms of people, and what this Jesuit network has seen. In the first week following his inauguration, President Trump announced two executive orders that tied human mobility to national security threats. In addition to his calls for the construction of a wall along the southern border of the United States, they called for an increase in immigration and customs enforcement and border patrol agents, for increases in detention, including that of asylum seekers, for increasing the criminal prosecution of entry and reentry. These executive orders also changed the priorities that guided ICE's enforcement activity under the previous administration by essentially eliminating them, in turn making all individuals who lack legal status vulnerable to detention and deportation. We have also seen the administration eliminate and threaten existing protections. I want to ask you to pay special attention to this piece um, because I don't know how many of you are already familiar with it, but it's one of the pieces that we're going to ask you to speak to tomorrow. About 300,000 individuals from nine different countries hold what is called Temporary Protected Status, or TPS. This status provides protection from deportation and also work authorization for up to 18 months for individuals from certain countries who were in the United States when their countries were deemed by the US government um, to face extraordinary circumstances that did not allow for the country to receive and repatriate their citizens. So under law, the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security has the authority to extend this designation according to the current con conditions in each of those countries. Decisions on the extension or the termination of Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Haiti will be made at any moment now. Just Friday night, we heard um, reports that the US Department of State believes that protection for these populations is no longer necessary, despite the fact that each of these countries sees high rates of outmigration, people leaving in search of life when conditions in their home country does not provide. As you can imagine, this determination will have a profound, prof very profound impacts for these TPS holders, for their families, including many US citizen children, 
For the communities they have contributed to, many for over 20 years, and for their home countries and the broader region. So that's one form of the temporary protective, of, of temporary status or temporary protections that we're talking about. Additionally, as you know, on September 5th, the administration announced its decision to rescind DACA, those limited protections for young people who came to this country as children and know it as their home, yet lack the legal status they need to fully integrate. As you've heard this weekend, despite its limitations, DACA has allowed them to pursue their dreams of higher education and career advancement to more fully contribute to their families and to their communities. This decision has impacted many in this Ignatian family and about 800,000 throughout our country. The Jesuits in the United States have long stood with the US Catholic bishops in calling for the comprehensive reform of our immigration system. But the urgency of this, need, of this need has never been felt like it is now as DACA recipients begin to lose the limited protections and work authorizations they've had in recent years. So the cancellation of these temporary protections only leaves many, nearly one million more, vulnerable to the very real threat of detention and deportation. So these are the policies, but what about the people? ICE arrests within the US have increased by approximately 40% compared to the same period last year, and the Jesuit network has not been immune. We have seen families separated and communities heartbroken when loved ones were detained and deported. Though we know that this is not new, we have seen the impact of this administration's changed priorities as people who would not have been affected previously were suddenly uprooted. Similarly, our partners at the Kino Border Initiative can give testament to the families they've seen torn apart. In the first nine months of this year, they have seen a 143% increase of deportations of parents away from US citizen children. We see people with hopes and dreams, uncertain of what will be possible and what the future holds for themselves and their families. We see fear and we see the pain of exclusion. Is this what we want to be building for our communities and for our country? Division, separation, Fragmenting our families and communities, fear, exclusion, is not what our faith teaches us. Instead, it calls us to compassion and humanity, to seeing the face of God in one another, to seeking to understand, and to fuller participation of all in our communities as we work together for the common good. Our elected officials need to hear that we seek policies that reflect these values. Right now on the Hill, maybe not today, but, but right now, your senators and representatives are engaging in conversations, debates, negotiations on the fate of dreamers, on the fate of undocumented individuals, on the fate of TPS holders. Some are talking about what they're willing to trade for a solution for these people. So I want to ask you to please join us in telling them, thank you. One, support, co-sponsor a bill that provides pathway to citizenship, the DREAM Act of 2017. We've been grateful to see various bills introduced by members of both major political parties and in both the House and the Senate that would provide a pathway to citizenship for DREAMers. Among them, we believe the DREAM Act to be the most comprehensive solution. Number two, 
do not tie funds for detention, deportation, and additional border security to it. In May of this year, we saw that Congress chose not to grant the President's full request for immigration enforcement and border security funding, funds that were necessary to fully implement his executive orders. But Congress did increase what the U.S. was already spending on these efforts, including funding for an additional 5,000 detention beds, an additional $1.5 billion for border security. The President and many members of Congress will probably, would probably like to see these ramped up even further. But increasing funding for interior enforcement and border security contradict the essence of the DREAM Act and only further separate our families and our communities. We want a clean DREAM Act. And number three, support TPS holders. Now you'll see two points up here. The first is urge the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security to extend TPS for Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Haiti. As, as I had mentioned, the Secretary has the authority to do so based on the conditions of each of these countries and will be making a decision any moment now. You should be aware that we're expecting a decision on this tomorrow, and so it could be that a decision is actually announced while you're on the Hill. So please just have that in mind. Uh, our most immediate ask is that the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security would extend this temporary protection, but if the Secretary of Department of Homeland Security fails to extend that protection, it's even more important that they hear your second ask, which is to support a permanent legislative solution that allows for these longtime members of our communities to more fully integrate. Um, I want to say that um, a moment ago I spoke about the detrimental impacts of policy that, that we have seen in our network. But I think just as important are the signs of hope which also abound in this network. Immigrants and those from mixed status families show me resilience every day and show that hope every day. We see it in the courage that they have as they share their stories with us. Um, in, and in people who come out to a company to listen, to support. Throughout this network, we have seen your efforts in letter writing and in call-in campaigns, advocacy on local policies, um, efforts as part of uh, ISN's campaign for hospitality. And this is important. This is essential because we need more hope, but also because rowing into the deep requires a long-term commitment. I want to thank you for each and every drop that you contribute. I truly believe that the contributions each of us here makes do make a difference, especially when we add them up in this family and with those of the broader church and other organizations with common hopes and dreams. And when we allow those experiences to also change us. I want to wrap up um, just real quickly sharing um, an experience today. I was fortunate to have the opportunity to eat lunch with a young woman who has seen the impacts of some of these policies very, very personally. And when I asked her what she thought about the teaching and what her experience here had been, um, she said very candidly that it was great that we're all here talking about justice and about solidarity. But what are we all going to do when we leave here? And I want to bring that to you as a challenge for all of us. <laughs> Tomorrow we take our asks to the Hill, but we have to remember that this is one step as part of a much larger journey. I'm grateful to share uh, this journey for you and uh, with you, and I thank you for your commitment to being here and to continuing to struggle for a world that is closer to what God might imagine for us all. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, for your for your words of uh, what we ought to be doing in our, in our legislative priorities. Francisco is going to provide us a song that perhaps during this song we can think about what 
Kristen asked of us, which is, what ought we to do? What are we going to do after today? What are we going to do tomorrow? And then what are we going to do back home in our schools, in our parishes, in our communities? Thank you. Thank you, Francisco, and thank you, Kristen. Our last keynote speaker is Dr. Maria J. Steffen. Dr. Steffen is a senior advisor at the U.S. Institute of Peace and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, where she focuses on civil resistance, nonviolent movements, and their relevance to conflict transformation and democratic development. At the Atlantic Council, she co-leads the Future of Authoritarianism Project. Previously, Dr. Steffen was lead foreign affairs officer in the U.S. State Department's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, where she worked on both policy and operations for Afghanistan and Syria engagements. Earlier, Steffen directed policy and research at the International Center of Nonviolent Conflict, ICNC. She simultaneously taught courses on human rights and civil resistance at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service and American University's School of International Service. Having earned her MA and PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and a bachelor's degree from Boston College, Dr. Steffen's work, written works include articles that have appeared in numerous publications, including but not limited to the New York Times, Washington Post, and NPR. She is also the co-author of the book Why Civil Resistance Work, Works, a book I definitely read in my college peace studies class. The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict, which was awarded the 2012 Woodrow Wilson Foundation Prize by the American Political Science Association, and the 2012 University of Louisville Grawmeyer Award for Ideas Improving World Order. Dr. Steffen has worked with the European NATO Policy Office of the US Department of Defense and at NATO HQ, or headquarters in Brussels. She is the recipient of Harry S. Truman and J. William Fulbright National Scholarships. At such a time in history, Dr. Steffen's work is, a, is as critical and necessary as it's ever been. She is truly remarkable, and we are honored to have her here with us today. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to the stage, Dr. Maria J. Steffen. Thanks very much. It is awesome to be here. Um, and can I just say it feels like a total super party in this hotel. You are dominating the Marriott. And it just like feels like Woodstock or probably closer to my generation, a fish concert. And also because I'm from Vermont. 
So, like, congratulations for rocking it out today. And let's see. And so, first of all, thank you so much to the Ignatian Solidarity Network for uh, shepherding two decades of teach-ins for social justice. I'm really pleased to be part of the 20th uh, annual Ignatian teach-in, which is an initiative, as you all know, with roots in nonviolent resistance to the brutal civil war in El Salvador that cost the lives of six Jesuit priests, including Archbishop Romero and his two companions in 1989. And it is just such a distinct pleasure to be speaking with so many young people who are dedicated to just doing it. When you work on nonviolent resistance and people power movements, youth have a really special place in your heart. They're catalysts for change. They have energy, creativity, and the natural inclination to defy authority. And these are all really important qualities when you're trying to build mass movements to confront injustices, build power, and win rights and freedoms. Some of the most amazing or organizers and activists I know, whether they're from the US immigrant rights movement, and I now know Nelson, yeah, the Chilean economic justice movement, or the Zimbabwean pro-democracy movement, they're all gutsy young people. So, let's see. How does this one work? So I also have to give a shout out to my fellow BC Eagles. Are there any in the room? Yeah. Very good. So I graduated from Boston College in 1999 with a degree in political science. Uh, and as you all know, service unto others is really a uh, part of the school's DNA. And you literally cannot cross the BC campus without being asked to make donations to at least five different student organizations, raising funds for some social justice uh, activity. So uh, it's amazing to be uh, with, the, with the Eagles here at, at, uh, uh, and with uh, the Boston College crowd. And you know, one thing you, you uh, learn when you're a student at BC is that faith and action really mean something. And kind of the Jesuit style of troublemaking stays with you really for a lifetime. So I'm grateful for that. And then there's the really pro profound name for this teach-in, Rowing into the Deep, where Magis meets, meets Justice. When I think about rowing into the deep, what comes to mind is being willing to take action and help others to find their purpose in the face of fear and uncertainty. And actually, that's how uh, Marshall Gans, who's one of the great organizers in this country and who marched alongside Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, and Martin Luther King, that's how he defined leadership. And Magus, that is super Ignatian. It means doing more, being more, and achieving more than you may have ever thought possible. That's powerful stuff for the times we're living in now. When you consider the challenges we face, growing economic inequality, resurgent authoritarianism, cataclysmic climate change, politics grounded in hate and exclusion, their solutions require leadership, strategic organizing, and solidarity across issues and geographies. And that is why this annual gathering is so important. When I think of achieving the unimaginable, I think of people power. People power, also known as civil resistance or nonviolent action, is a means of wielding power without the threat or use of violence. It's when unarmed people often facing extreme violence and oppression, come together and fight back using nonviolent methods like demonstrations, strikes, boycotts, and other forms of civil disobedience and non-cooperation. Often they have achieved important victories. When you consider this country alone, the anti-slavery movement, women's suffrage, the US Civil Rights Movement, the United Farm Workers Movement, LGBTQI rights, jobs with justice, and the movement for black lives. 
all of these major advances in human rights and human dignity were brought about by organized groups of people who rode into the deep, resisted, and persevered. Just to rewind a little bit, um, after my BC junior year abroad in Strasbourg, France, I decided that international affairs was my thing. So at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, I studied international security studies, international negotiation and conflict resolution and human rights. So basically war, peace and justice. At that time, I attended a Boston film screening of A Force More Powerful, a documentary film about six highly consequential nonviolent struggles. The film, um, the film highlighted how unarmed civilians stared down the British Empire in India, led by Mahatma Gandhi, how they confronted Nazis in Denmark, fought apartheid in South Africa, and removed dictators in Chile and Poland, and dismantled Jim Crow in the US through nonviolent struggle. That film was an amazing inspiration for me. It brought people power to life, and I determined to focus my academic career on studying the strategic dimensions of nonviolent resistance. In other words, how does David really beat Goliath without violence? So after finishing my PhD, I met a woman named Erica Chenoweth, uh, a fellow political scientist and a domestic terrorism expert. Erica happens to be a numbers freak and a quantitative guru, and she was skeptical that anything nonviolent could be effective against the most formidable of opponents. And she wasn't the only one. Associated with nonviolent organizing, negotiating differences, building coalitions, and collective action reinforce democratic norms and behaviors, and they tend to produce more peaceful societies. Nonviolent civil resistance, then, is a functional alternative to violence with both short and long-term positive effects. It is a particularly powerful nonviolent channel for marginalized or oppressed people to challenge systems of power, whether they are exploitative corporations, dictatorships, or institutionalized racism, and to build more inclusive and just societies. And not surprisingly, Pope Francis has taken note of the power of nonviolent action. In his 2017 World Day of Peace address, which is called Nonviolence, a Style of Politics for Peace, which is really a clutch document that I hope and dream one day may form the basis of an encyclical on the same topic. In that document, Pope Francis noted that, quote, momentous change in the lives of people, nations, and states has come about by means of peaceful protest using only the weapons of truth and justice. And indeed, the Catholic Church has played a pivotal role in some of the most momentous uh, nonviolent struggles in history. You recall the Filipino religious sisters who confronted military forces in a kleptocratic Marcos dictatorship in prayerful resistance during the 1986 people power movement there. Across, across the Philippines, uh, priests and nuns train their communities in nonviolence and nonviolent action. Cardinal Jamie Sin attended one of those workshops, and he later joined the Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines in calling for a nonviolent struggle for justice, using ra Radio Veritas to amplify the message. This preparation, combined with an election monitoring mission led by local religious leaders, paved the way to Marcos's nonviolent ouster. And today, uh, Filipino religious sisters and priests and um, congregants are using nonviolent resistance in the face of yet another violent dictator, Rodrigo Duterte. And I wish them well in their struggle. During the Polish Solidarity Movement in the 1980s, Pope John Paul II, together with local priests and nuns, famously stood shoulder to shoulder with the worker-led movement that challenged communist tyranny with nonviolent resistance. 
Archbishop um, Oscar Romero of El Salvador was martyred for showing solidarity with campesinos and other victims of junta brutality. In the US, feisty women religious, including Sister Simone and Sister Pat, <laughs> These feisty women have taken to the buses and to the streets to give voice to the poor and to the undocumented. Some of them have animated Laudato Si through direct action to protect the environment. You know, I'm often asked the question, well, what about the really, really hard cases? What about cases of genocide or ethnic cleansing or violent extremism? What about protecting innocent people? What are the nonviolent options in these situations? First, I should say that I don't come at this topic from a pacifist perspective. I'm also the first to admit that nonviolent action has not always worked. It's not always succeeded. At the same time, it's really interesting to note that nonviolent protests and other forms of collective action have won tactical concessions from extremist groups like ISIS in Iraq and Syria. And a little Sojourner, uh, Sojourner shout out if anyone from Sojourners is in the room. Thank you. And Al Shabaab in East Africa. For example, women's led protests uh, outside an ISIS headquarters, this is the Islamic State in Raqqa, Siri, led to the release of political prisoners in 2014. And two years ago, uh, in northeastern Kenya, fighters from the Al-Shabaab terrorist group ambushed a bus filled with Christians and Muslims. In the past, uh, this had been a precursor to mass slaughter of the Christians when they se separated into religious groups. In this case, the busload of unarmed civilians fought back using very interesting weapons. The Muslim women put hijabs on the heads of the Christian women to protect them. When the men were asked to get off the bus, they refused. They refused to separate according to their religious identities. And amazingly, the collective stubbornness of this group it led to all the people on the bus surviving except for one. It's one incident, but it demonstrates the power of nonviolent resistance even in these difficult cases. I would also flag one really interesting nonviolent option even in these really difficult situations. Some of you may have heard of unarmed civilian protection, which is the use of unarmed civilians to do peacekeeping. This has helped deter violence and human rights abuses in conflict zones coming from state actors, militias, uh, drug lords, and the like. A very interesting uh, nonviolent option. Nonviolent Peace Force, Christian peacemakers teams, Peace Brigades International, and Operation Dove have led civilian peacekeeping missions in South Sudan, Sri Lanka, Colombia, Guatemala, the Philippines, Indonesia, Israel, Palestine, and elsewhere. And evaluations of this technique reveal that unarmed peacekeeping has saved lives, changed the behavior of armed groups, and made local peace and human rights work more possible. And of course, it goes without saying that if you want to prevent atrocities, you prevent war. Prevention demands investment. And right now, the levels of US and global investment in violence prevention are really tiny compared to the sums uh, dedicated to war fighting. And this is perhaps an issue uh, that you can raise with your members of Congress tomorrow. So far, I've focused a great deal on nonviolent resistance because this is what I know the best. But we know that this is one set of tools in a much broader nonviolent toolkit. Transforming violent conflict and dissolving its root causes requires a combination of people power and peace building. That means linking nonviolent resistance, which intentionally escalates conflict, together with traditional peace building tools like negotiation, dialogue, and mediation, which de escalate it. Martin Luther King Jr. understood this dynamic in extremely well. As he so eloquently, eloquently wrote in his letter from a Birmingham jail in 1963, you may well ask why direct action 
why the sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are quite right, he said, in calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks to so dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. It's one of the most amazing speeches I think that one can read. So one group of women who are acutely aware of power dynamics and how to combine protest and peace building are women. Shout out to the women. Multiple studies have found that women's inclusion in peace processes correlates significantly with their success, with Northern Ireland and Liberia, which is featured here, are the most classic examples. And I would note that in this case, Liberian women organized to put an end to the civil war in that country. And you know what their most famous tactic was? Sex boycotts. Just worth thinking about. But anyway, as we all know, certainly in this room, women bring unique identities, perspectives, and a sense of urgency to peace processes. While women often need to fight for a place at the table, it stands to reason that unlocking the leadership potential of women at all levels of an organization or institution including the Catholic Church, would strengthen its ability to forge peace. Another nonviolent tool, dialogue and mediation, has helped resolve some of the most intractable violent conflicts, including the wars in El Salvador, Guatemala, Northern Ireland, and Colombia. The Catholic Church, often in partnership with other faith groups, has often been a key mediator. You all probably know the critical role that Pope Francis played recently in ending over 30 years of Colombia's civil war. And also, this is an interesting example for folks who study conflict and conflict resolution. The San Egidio group. So may be familiar with this Catholic lay community of San Egidio, which is a Rome-based organization with some serious mediation skills and a biblical commitment to service, compassion, and peace which played a critical role in ending the devastating Mozambique Civil War in 1992. Faith groups have historically contributed in significant ways to transitional justice and reconciliation. In Guatemala, the Catholic Church helped initiate, organize, and execute the successful National Truth Commission, the recovery of historical memory project in the mid-90s. In Chile, the Catholic Church advocated for the country's uh, Commission on Truth and Reconciliation following Pinochet's removal from power in 1990, which was a core component of that country's transition to democracy. The Chilean Commission, incidentally, helped inspire the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was shepherded by Bishop Tutu, as we all know. Now, since I'm getting to the near, near the end of my remarks, let me offer a bit of practical um, ideas about how the Catholic Church and its committed social justice foot soldiers, as you all are, can help make the church an even stronger global leader in advocating for just peace. I'll, pro I'll just propose three ideas. First, consider joining the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative. CNI is a project of Pax Christi International and is committed to affirming the centrality of nonviolence and nonviolent action to the life and work of the church at all levels. The initiative grew out of last year's Vatican co-sponsored conference in Rome on nonviolence and just peace, which I was honored to attend and which was attended by theologians, activists, peace builders from conflict zones around the world. You all are the perfect group to help 
CNI find energetic, creative expression in Catholic schools, colleges, and universities around the world. It would be an amazingly powerful thing if only eight to 10 schools came together and organized a global teach-in on what it means practically to build just peace. Second, and related to the first, imagine your Catholic schools and universities as just peace laboratories that can educate and train young people and communities in the full menu of nonviolent options and their practical strategic application. That includes training and skills building in nonviolent direct action, dialogue and peace building, and advocacy that leads to legal and policy change. There are lots of training resources available developed by different organizations, with my organization, the U.S. Institute of Peace, being one of them. But there are many resources available in many different languages. I think it's especially important, especially in the polarized society and world that we're living in today, to emphasize the relationship between dialogue and direct action, the dialogical and the direct action approaches, between nonviolent escalation and de-escalation, and about how to channel the pressure and energy of the streets into concrete policy change. Third, consider using advocacy opportunities, like what you all will be doing on Capitol Hill tomorrow, to amplify the voices of courageous nonviolent activists and peace builders from the US and from around the world. People in general are moved by stories. And there are so many stories of nonviolent heroes and sheroes that need to be told. Activists and human rights defenders. Nice. Activists and human rights defenders need to know that people on the outside are watching and standing with them in solidarity. And don't underestimate the power of solidarity. Center their voices. And I would also, as long as I have the opportunity as a former State Department person here, which is maybe a strange voice in this, in this crowd, but as long as um, I was a former US government official, one thing I would just know is that there's a desperate need for young people committed to social justice to enter public service in government. It's not everyone's calling. It's definitely not everyone's calling, but we all know that, that to bring change, you need people on the inside and you need people on the outside. And you need an inside-outside strategy. So I would encourage you to consider a career in public service. Now let me end with some wise words from a wise woman, and some of you may have seen this quote many times. And I'll uh, offer this up for my mom, who's a particular fan of Dorothy Day. People say, what is the sense of our small effort? They cannot see that we must lay one brick at a time, take one step at a time. A pebble cast into a pond causes ripples that spread in all directions. Each one of our thoughts, our words, and deeds is like that. No one has a right to sit down and feel hopeless. There is too much work to do. So I would like to wish all of you from the bottom of my heart the very best as you continue to fight the good fights and work towards a more just and peaceful world. Thank you very much.
Do you take your seats, please? My name is Colleen Dully. I'm an O'Hare Fellow at American Media. And every year at the Teach-In, we host a film festival called the Voices from the Margins Film Festival. It's hosted by America and by the Ignatian Solidarity Network. And this year we had 50 entries from over 40 universities, many of them Jesuit. And um, we also hosted a, an online voting uh, like for the, sorry, for the crowd favorite um, in, among these entries. And the crowd favorite after over 500 votes were submitted is We Are One by Alicia and Hannah Menakaya. So ladies, could you come up and get your awards? <laughs> Uh, so we created this film in LA and we reached out, we had over a hundred people volunteer to be in it. We just reached out to people saying, you know, if you want to support Black Lives Matter, we're making a video kind of to promote solidarity in the face of police brutality. And the point of our film was we wanted to call people out while calling them in. So calling people out for being so desensitized by social media and then calling people in to recognize that like what hurts one community hurts all of our communities. The purpose of our film is to raise unheard voices, to express that police brutality is not a black problem, it's a people problem. <laughs> Lastly, lastly, we'd like to express that Black Lives Matter is not anti-police. Without further ado, we are one. I put my hands up to the altar. I tried to run away. I asked her to put my hands up to the altar. I tried to put my hands up to the altar. I tried to run away. I asked her to put my hands up to the altar. I had a dream last night. Everything looked familiar, like I'd been there before. And there was a storm. Waves whipped my back as people stood watching as my life hashtagged before my eyes. I saw a sea of faces, all black and blue and hurting. You sang to me, just keep swimming. Then we were all drowning. And I couldn't save anyone. I heard, get down, hands up. As the levees of our humanity broke, she appeared. She said, though there may be no clouds on your side of town, you will still feel the rain. Perhaps you like the comfort of your umbrella and shiver at the thought of a splash of water in your face. Call it Black Lives Matter, trendy millennial bullshit, but I just need you to wake the fuck up. I said to her, it's not just sprinkling out, it's pouring. There's thunder and lightning and I'm fucking scared. I'm scared of being black, of being a woman, of being queer, of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, of being alive. I don't know. She held me close. We are united by the freedom born in the heart of mankind. It is our duty to deliver it from the hands that press us down to drown. It is our right to speak freedom into existence, to watch it grow, to let it ring. Then I will go. Wow, 
thank you. Give, let's give another round of applause. That was amazing. Thank you. Okay, just a couple quick announcements before Mass. Um, this evening, small group advocacy trainings will take place at 7.15 in all of the breakout spaces. If you haven't received your training room assignment, please send one person from your delegation to the registration desk to find out more. Okay, and our last, our last announcement before we break, uh, if you're participating in the choir, remember to follow the instructions you received today to come up to the stage. Uh, to practice and prepare. Readers and Eucharistic ministers, Eucharistic ministers should also come up at this time. We're gonna take a break. Mass will start promptly at 4.30, uh, so please feel free to rise, take a break, use the restroom, but please be back at 4.30 for our closing liturgy.